Nonviolence Radio, covering the beat of nonviolence worldwide from the Meta Center for Nonviolence in Petaluma, California. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Nonviolence Radio. We explore the power of active nonviolence in our world today, especially through constructive program, constructive channels, because the Meta Center is behind Nonviolence Radio, and our logo is actually a spinning wheel. And people look at that and they say, well, what does that mean? And the spinning wheel represents Gandhi's constructive program. Instead of just direct resistance all the time, there was a program called, you know, the spinning wheel program, where people would create their own cloth and they would create their own uh, clothing in order to resist the hegemony of the British empires take on their on their mills to show that we can build what we want without having you provide it for us. So it's a pretty neat concept in nonviolence, <laughs> uh, to say the least, and it's uh, something that we like to emphasize on our show as much as possible. Yeah, I, uh, I want to add there's another dimension to the spinning wheel, and that is it's not just a resistance by Indians against British rule, but everything that British rule stood for, namely commercialization, uh, commoditization, and the uh, lack of decentralized cottage industry. I mean, the whole point was not just to shake off the British rule, but to shake off what a Western civilization was trying to impose on India. And I, I'm afraid that part of the program hasn't uh, stuck very well. Uh, Nehru was not on board with it, and there were probably good reasons why he felt he had to industrialize. But it stands today, the spinning wheel, the charka, st or as they, my Indian friends keep telling me, charka, <laughs> stands for uh, the restoration of cottage industry, individual interdependence and grassroots effort and so forth. Mm. And in front of me here in the studio, I have a document called Warheads to Windmills, How to Pay for a Green New Deal. This sounds very constructive program to me, very detailed. And it's by Tim Wallace, and he is the executive director of Nuclear Ban U.S., a partner of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, which won the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize for its work facilitating the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And in the intro to this, to this document, it says this, Our survival as a planet depends on drastically curbing greenhouse gas emissions in the very near future. Our survival also depends on completely eliminating the danger of nuclear weapons. By fortunate coincidence, the resources, federal funding, private funding, scientific and technical expertise, jobs and infrastructure currently being wasted on nuclear weapons can be shifted to the production of green technologies to address the climate crisis. Welcome to Nonviolence Radio, Tim Wallace. Hi, welcome. Thanks. <laughs> Hello, Tim. Good to hear your voice. How are you? Hi, Michael. Good. I'm good. Thanks. <laughs> so, you know, we're here to pick your brain about the warheads to windmills, how to pay for a Green New Deal, because that's one of the, you know, the biggest questions the mass media will throw at the Green New Deal to try to get people to not be in favor of it. Well, how are we going to pay for it? You know, where is the money going to come from? And you have a brilliant idea. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe start off with just a summary of what inspired you to do this work, uh, to come out with this paper, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay. Well, um, I've been, as you know, uh, involved in nonviolent campaigns all my life and working on peace movements and on the nuclear weapons issue in particular. And uh, I was very fortunate to be part of the negotiations for the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which was agreed well, almost three years ago now, in 2017, at the United Nations, when 122 countries agreed to ban nuclear weapons uh, without the support of the countries that actually have nuclear weapons, but that's a longer story. 
Uh, and so I've been I've been working on that issue for some time, but also very concerned about climate change and other issues that that are posing a, a greater and greater threat to our future. And um, what inspired me to to work on this particular project was actually a, a similar report that was done in England uh, by the Campaign Against Arms Trade, which was called Arms to Renewable, and which looked not only at the um, the money that was needed to um, build a renewable energy economy, but also at the jobs that were required and the skills that were required to actually make this transition and to solve the remaining problems that we still face to build a, a green renewable economy. Mm-hmm. And their report in the UK was a, directly linked the the kinds of skills and jobs required to, for instance, build a, a, a new tidal wave energy project in the north of England mm-hmm. with the skills and the jobs that were being swallowed up by the nuclear submarine industry in that exact area to build a whole new generation of nuclear submarines. And so they, mm-hmm. this report you know, highlighted the fact that you know, if we only used not just the money but the people that we need mm. and the resources, um, if we use those very people to to be building our what we need to survive instead of what we need for more death, um, we could we could solve both these problems at once. And so that inspired me to to look at what we could do here in the U.S. I couldn't find a similar report, so I wrote it myself. Yay, that's what exactly <laughs> what we're talking about, the constructive aspect of this. That's awesome. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, in the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, gives us how many years before we need to, you know, th- that we need to take drastic action in 10 years? Yeah. Is? Well, we have, I mean, the, all, all the estimates say, you know, we have until 2050 mm-hmm. to actually... Um, bring the entire global carbon emissions down to net zero so that we're producing as much carbon as we actually take in through trees and so on. But that requires a massive effort in the next 10 years, up until 2030, to actually cut cut emissions by r- roughly half in that time. And so that's where the real big push has to happen, because if we wait too late, it's, it's, it's too late to make that transition. Exactly. And so... Then, but you might be a little bit biased, right? If I mean, if you've been working on the nuclear issue, tell us about nuclear ban <laughs> and the work there. And yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things about, um, I mean, obviously the money could come from a number of sources. You know, I mean, the, the military budget is is massive in the U.S. I mean, it's more than of all other countries combined, let alone all of the you know the U.S. supposed you know adversaries. But all countries in the world combined don't spend as much on their military as the U.S. does. So that's a huge amount of money that could be used for other purposes. And, of course, you know, we've been piling up national debt, paying for, you know, bailing out the banks or giving tax credits to the to the ultra-wealthy and corporations and so on. So there's other ways to get the money. But um, what I'm looking at is not just the money, but also, as I said, the skills and the technology and the resources and the infrastructure that we have in place already to actually move over to addressing climate change. But also the the, the international um, environment that we need to actually solve these problems. We need international cooperation on a scale that we've not seen at all. And certainly with... Um, you know, even even in the Democratic Party at the moment, you know, there's just so much sort of inbuilt hostility to China and to Russia and to you know, America first. We've got to we've got to you know solve climate, but you know we've got to put American jobs first and all this kind of language. Mm-hmm. And really, what we need to be doing is building relations with these countries. The largest carbon emitters in the world are China, the U.S., India, and Russia. And they're all pointing nuclear weapons at each other, and that's no no coincidence. You know, we've got to address how we relate to each other in the world, and so that's that's how these all link up, in my in my view. And um, mm. and I was coming at it, as I said, from the nuclear yeah. issue, from the nuclear ban treaty, because that's one of the missing links. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. people in this country are 
more and more aware and concerned and, and want to see action on, on climate because it's it's so immediate. And yet, as you probably know, and I'm sure many of your listeners know, um, you know, the dangers of, from nuclear weapons are growing every day and people are just not paying attention to it. The, the boats of atomic scientists, you know, uh, at, at the end of the Cold War, put their doomsday clock back, you know, to more than, I think, what, 17 minutes to midnight. And now it's back up to two minutes to midnight, you know, the closest it's been since 1953. And that's how dangerous we are, uh, you know, with these treaties that are being um, abandoned and with the growing developments, you know, in this country and with new co- new countries coming on board with nuclear weapons. I mean, the whole situation is getting more and more dangerous and people are just not as aware about that. Well, and nothing seems like it would offer the handshake of community more than than disarmament, right? Saying we we can build community because we're willing to be in community with you in an authentic way uh, by not yeah. wanting to threaten you with uh, imminent death and destruction. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, nuclear weapons are a threat yes. that we put on other countries saying, you know, you do as we we say, or we'll blow you to smithereens. Right. It's not it's not a good way to build relationships. <laughs> right. Now you said that India, China, uh, Russia, and the yeah, U.S. Right. are the the largest carbon emitters, as well as uh, nuclear, having the most nuclear weapons all pointed at each other. And you said that that uh, makes sense, but it doesn't make sense to me. Can you explain that a little bit more? Just that the you know the, the the largest countries, and if you include Europe and you know the U.S. major nuclear allies, including Japan and Australia and so on. I mean, we're talking about three quarters of all carbon emissions are coming from countries with nuclear weapon alliances. You know, all pointing at each other: India and Pakistan and Israel and so on. Um, and it's you know it's part of the the sort of global economy uh, that, you know, the richest countries and the most powerful countries uh, want to lord it over everybody else. And, you know, one of the things about the nuclear ban treaty that I was involved in at the United Nations, you know, the thing that was so exciting about it was uh, the, the, these big countries, you know, U.S. and Russia and China and so on, refused to have anything to do with it, which to some people here, means, well, it's a pointless treaty, it doesn't mean anything, you know, what, what, who cares what these little countries say. But the reality was that this was one of the first times where the, the world came together without the big countries and the, you know, bullying them and said, like, you know, this, this affects all of us, it affects everybody. If there's a nuclear war anywhere, we're all going to be affected. Uh, and so the small countries were given a voice and and given a, a a power that they rarely have to sort of set the tone and say you know this is not the kind of world we want you know we want a world without nuclear weapons and we're gonna we've waited seventy years for the nuclear countries to do something about it and they haven't so we're gonna do it ourselves and um, so it's it's about you know the world sort of coming together the smaller countries and the 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 poorer parts of the world you know coming together to say. This is this is what we want. This is what we're going to push for, and it does come down to uh, come back to as, a, as a, I mean to to the sort of nonviolence side of it because you know th- these countries have a lot more power than people realize to to change the world. You know, I mean when when countries like Brazil and Nigeria and Argentina and so on, you know, say and Mexico, South Africa. You know, they band together and say, we don't want nuclear weapons anymore, and we're going to actually make this a legally binding treaty, and we're going to put pressure on these countries to stop having nuclear weapons because their their companies and their their investors are all spread all over the world. And this is going to affect the United States and the other nuclear companies, even if they don't sign on to it. Yeah. I don't know if I explained that very well. No, no, no. I, what I see emerging from what you're saying is essentially uh, – these smaller countries that are getting ready for Satyagraha in a way, and they are yeah. engaging in that constructive decision-making process where they're uh, willing to go forward and to resist when necessary, using different kinds of tactics and pressure through legal means and so forth that will help to add more pressure to the issue. Uh, Michael's been wanting to say something for a bit. I'm going to bring him. Oh, 
Okay. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> probably not surprised him. <laughs> uh, Tim, there was a, a brilliant observation that you made uh, that this is historic in the sense that the non-nuclear nations are standing apart and standing together against the power of the nuclear club. And it it is a model, actually, of what's happening on another level where indigenous people are recognizing one another's capacities and standing up. And within countries, for example, I'm going to be talking about the uh, resistance, incredible resistance that's going on in India right now. So that that was like a qualitative difference, and it's going to be much harder for the United States to stand up on a pedestal and give itself the label of the leader of the free world and and similar ideologies when the free world is saying, hey, we don't want you guys uh, doing this. So so that that is a very powerful thing if we can develop it and, and, uh, and uh, implement it across the board. But I, I want to ask you this question, Tim, from the Gandhian point of view, because as you mentioned just now, the nonviolence aspect of this, from the Gandhian point of view, if we wanted these ca- this twin campaign, ICANN and uh, Warheads to Windmills, to succeed, it seems to me what we would have to do is build absolutely everything that we can by ourselves as we are making the demands, in other words, do absolutely everything we can without the money, you know, by recruiting personnel and writing documents and so forth, and then that will really put us in a strong position from the point of view of using constructive program. Huh? So, uh, first of all, I... I, I forgot to mention something <laughs> and that is that <laughs> and that is I think your document is brilliant it, it is so systematic and nobody is ever going to be able to say now with a straight face but where will the money come from you know you haven't thought this through this, this is a real Elizabeth Warren kind of document <laughs> so I, I, I we're very very pleased with it from that point of view but our people your co-workers, are they approaching it from the standpoint of not, we demand you give us the resources to do this, but we're going to do absolutely everything we can and then push forward from that position? Well, one of the main aspects of our overall campaign is divestment and boycotting of the nuclear weapons industry, which we are uh, trying to get people to do on an individual level and institutionally, with space communities, with um, businesses, banks, and also towns and cities and states. And um, this is something we're, we're trying to push in the U.S. alongside, as I said, the, the pressure that's going to start coming, that is coming from the rest of the world on this. Because one of the greatest powers we have in terms of influencing the the, you know, the decision making at the, at the level of the U.S. government, for instance, is on, the, on these companies which rely on investors. They rely on consumers buying their other products. Not, not you know, we don't buy nuclear weapons that often, but we do buy, you know, thermostats from Honeywell, for instance. Um, and um, you know, when this treaty enters into force, then other countries, like some of the ones that I've just mentioned, are going to be putting pressure on these companies. And we can be doing that in the meantime here in this country by saying, you know, we we want nothing to do with these nuclear weapons companies and we don't want anybody um, buying from them or investing in them, including banks and so on. Some of the largest, I mean, two out of the five largest pension funds in the world have already divested from nuclear weapons. And New York City is... Um, about to vote on uh, the, the New York City Council is having has a resolution to divest the city of New York from nuclear weapons, which would be which would be huge in, in this country. And we've got a bill in the state house in Massachusetts, and there's one pending for for California and so on. So we're we're working at that. I mean, I don't know if that's quite what you had in mind, but I mean, we're working on that at that level to try to put pressure on these companies and through the companies on the governments. But in terms of the, the the Green New Deal side of it, you know, I mean, this is a, a I mean, you know, my my argument in the in the report is that 
we cannot solve the climate crisis without government intervention because it's, it's too massive. It requires a, a, a very large scale intervention. And um, that's what the Green New Deal is all about. And that's going to cost money. And so, I mean, there are ways of implementing the Green New Deal, again, at the state level, at the city level, at the individual level. I mean, we need to get people putting solar panels on their roof and buying electric cars and putting up windmills and school playgrounds and, and public buildings and businesses. And, you know, there's a lots and lots that people do have to do. But at the same time, you know, the um, the scale of what's needed and the research that's needed um, is is you know at, at a sort of government scale. Uh, and and uh, there's no question that at some point massive government intervention is going to have to come in. But it's just that uh, while we're doing the resistant things, you were talking about the boycotts and so forth. We also should be doing the building things, however small yeah. they are. And as, as you were pointing out, every entity, every scale, has its role to play. And I'm happy yeah. to tell you that out, out here in California, in our local area here, we're doing very well. We have climate emergency uh, declarations at the city level going forward and, and so yeah. forth. But, uh, yeah, I think that that does get to it. I have one other comment that I'm going to make eventually, but first, Stephanie. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks so much, Michael. Yeah. For those of you tuning in, we're talking with Tim Wallace of Nuclear Ban U.S. about his report called Warheads to Windmills, How to Pay for a Green New Deal. And we have a little bit of time left for this interview, Tim, so... I think what would be most useful for our listeners and for the readers of the transcript later on waging nonviolence and elsewhere is if we gave them some talking points for skeptics, uh, people that will say, yeah, yeah, the Green New Deal, terrible idea. You know, what kind of <laughs> <laughs> or that's just, you know, socialism from AOC <laughs> and uh, it doesn't affect me. I'm sure I mean, I'm sure you wrote with the skeptics in mind. So let's systematically go through a few of those skeptics questions. Yep. Okay. Uh, uh, is So one, for example, is, yeah, this, I, I think of uh, folks that I know who are on the other end of the political spectrum who don't want, who don't believe, maybe who don't believe in climate change or don't like to use that term. Uh, so when we talk about Green New Deal, it's, it speaks to their kind of political amygdala and they say, oh, anything that says AOC on it is uh, socialism, and uh, this is not necessary. What do you say to that? Well, one of the uh, one one thing that I say, which is linked to the report directly, is that we we um, purposely put in the report not just two existential threats to our survival, but three, and the third one is inequality, and that is an important one to address because if we if we if we ignore that part then it's a lot easier to say well you know why why can't we just you know let's let people get on with their their solar panels or whatever and, and leave it at that um or you know work towards um you know agreements on nuclear weapons or whatever but the 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 really grotesque levels of inequality that we have now reached in this country and in the world are threatening not just a breakdown of society in general, because no society has ever survived this level of inequality um, historically, but we're also um, facing the kinds of problems that we have with you know, the rise of right-wing authoritarian governments and a rejection of of climate and so on, and refusal to to do anything because because people are are fearing for their own survival and their own you know they they get pushed into a corner and don't want to address these bigger issues. Um, and of course, climate will affect the poorest communities first and foremost and and most directly, and they're going to be the ones that are already you know I mean we we already know that many of the Immigrants and refugees fleeing to the borders of the U.S. are, are a result of climate and result of, of conflicts that are exacerbated by climate, and that's going to just uh, increase, you know, exponentially in the coming years, especially if we don't address this um, mm. adequately. So all those things are are interlinked, and and of course the 
the potential for violent conflict and eventually nuclear war, you know, also rise exponentially with inequality not being addressed and more and more resentment building up as as we see in, you know, if you just look at a map of the wall, you know, that separates the Palestinians on the West Bank from Israel, and you look at the, the wealth on one side and the poverty on the other side, I mean, this is this is being multiplied all around the world, and it's just not sustainable. And so, you know, you can you can turn your eyes to these other issues, but inequality is going to come back and hit hit us all if we're not if we don't. So that's 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 not going to answer that you mentioned that um, you know whose amygdala is, is triggered by AOC or whatever, but but it's an, it's one of the reasons why we're we're keeping that at the forefront in in this report. Other ways to respond to to skeptics are, I mean, you know, we're we're seeing more and more the evidence of of climate, you know, in our in our faces, you know, with the forest fires in Australia and so on. If people were in Hawaii a year ago, or know people who were in Hawaii when they had the false alarm about a nuclear weapon, um, a ballistic missile about to attack. And they had, you know, 30 minutes or so to to react before they found out it was a false alarm. I mean, those people, again, you know, had it directly in their face what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. And they, they, you know, some people were changed forever as a result of that. Yeah. That's- uh, we don't want to wait until there's a major accident or a major, you know, conflict between India and Pakistan or something like that. Or, or indeed, you know, over Iran or over mm-hmm. North Korea. Mm-hmm. But we just have to keep raising these issues and, and hoping that people will yeah. see that there's a, something to be concerned about. <laughs> yeah, I have, I have a couple more questions for you on the skepticism level before sure. we sign off. One, yeah. Another one is that, you know, look at China. They are, they are producing so many more emissions than the United States. Um, can you, how would you yeah. respond to that? Well, that's a very, that's a very important one because people like to think of, of us all in, you know, these separate little boxes, you know, we're the U.S., we're, we're not as bad as them over there in China. But, you know, as the trade deal with China just highlighted yesterday, the fact is that uh, most of China's emissions, carbon emissions, are due to their manufacturing output. And most of that manufacturing output ends up where? In the United States. You know, we are actually the ones that exported a lot of our industrial production to China, where it's cheaper and where there's fewer regulations and so on. And so it's U.S. corporations that sent their business to China to, to do their dirty work, as it were, and or people here who are buying things from China because they're cheaper and have also been made with, with fewer regulations and so on. Yeah. So it, it's not so simple to say, well, you know, China's uh, emissions are double the the, the U.S. emissions. The fact right. is that we're all in this together, and by us ignoring climate change as as Trump is doing, and and simply you know making things worse, we are we are given the green light to China and every, and India and everywhere else to say you know well if we're not doing anything about it, why why should they? You know, yeah. we've got to take a lead and we've got to say you know uh, I mean one one of the things in the report is about cars, for instance, Um, if we, which we have to do, we have to say in this country that by 2030, there will be no more gasoline and diesel fueled cars allowed for sale in the United States. Now, that will not just affect the United States, it will affect uh, China to some extent, but much more Japan and South Korea and Germany and so on, because we buy half of our cars from those countries. Mm -hmm. And those countries are going to be influenced by us making those kinds of decisions. So, um, right. so you know, yep. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, and then lastly, let's talk about, uh, briefly, a talking point about the quote-unquote green technologies and electric cars. And uh, mm-hmm. one, one complaint that I've heard is, well, the amount of energy that it takes and uh, resources that it takes to produce an electric car really negates its carbon-neutral value because it takes so much carbon to produce them. Can you speak to that? Yep, yep. Um, and this is, this is again, um, a tricky one because, you know, as things stand right now, 
Um, yes, it takes a lot of carbon to produce uh, windmills, uh, the steel and the concrete. Uh, it, takes, it takes carbon to produce um, electric cars. It takes carbon to produce, you know, vegan food because it's transported all across the country. Um, but, you know, unless we take steps now to, to reduce all of our carbon emissions everywhere, including transportation and including electricity generation, um, we can't we can't make progress anywhere. I mean, we have to start somewhere. And the reality is that um, you know industrial processes, including mining and so on, and the electricity that's being used to produce these things, and the transportation that's being used. Once that is all electrified, and that all the electricity comes from renewable electricity, then, you know, it's not going to be the case that electric cars, you know, are, are carbon produce, you know, use a lot of carbon to, to produce. They won't. They only, they only, they only use carbon now because we're not, you know, we're not using renewable energy to make them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So those things have to happen in tandem and we have to be working in that direction to get all of the um, transportation, electricity generation, and so on, and industrial processes, all to be uh, renewable, and then we'll be on track. But until then, there's going to be irregularities, and there's going to be, you know, products that we have to have, like electric cars for the future, or solar panels, or windmills. Yeah. We have to have those. Um, but in, until until all the things are, are up to speed and are, are electrified and renewable, then yes, we're going to have anomalies where, you know, a, a windmill is producing renewable energy, but it's been manufactured using carbon, right. you know. Right. Well, and, and, it's, and it really speaks to an opportunity. You know, we spend so much of our energy and uh, all our resources and in, in you know, uh, all kinds of science in the world, and so why don't we apply it to the problems that really matter, that, that need to be solved today? Uh, right, the, and we need the, the brain power lives with and us. The brain power that's being wasted on nuclear weapons and other on other other military technologies. That's that's the real crux of it. You know why? Why? I mean, you know, in our report, we look at the the STEM graduates uh, coming out of universities all across the country and the world, you know, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, Mm -hmm. they're all going into military um, jobs because that's where the money is and that's where the jobs are. Mm -hmm. And we need those people that have all those skills to be, you know, helping us solve the problems, not making more problems. (laughs) Yeah, and how amazing would it be if the military could really get behind the green technology movement too. That would be incredible. Yeah. Uh, Tim Wallace, how can people uh, get involved, read your report, uh, find out more? Well, the report is available free to download from www.nuclearban.us um, and you can order copies if you want it in, in, in paper, which is a lot easier to read. We can send it to you. Um, for a small donation to cover the costs. Mm -hmm. Um, You can get involved in our campaign. We have groups working around the country, as I said, on on local bills in in city and state legislatures, uh, working with trying to get local businesses and faith communities to divest from nuclear weapons. It's it's surprising to me that uh, there's a, a massive movement to divest from fossil fuels, but there's very, very little being done yet on nuclear weapons, and people are, you know, unknowingly actually supporting this industry of death. Mm-hmm. So getting, you know, your universities and colleges and banks and, uh, uh, you know, anything that you're connected to, to actually take this up and support the nuclear ban treaty and support the rest of the world that's looking to us to, to find solidarity within the U.S., so you know, that this global movement is actually going to succeed which I believe it will, um, you know, we need your help with that. So please join us. Great. Thank you so much for joining us, Tim Wallace of Nuclear Ban US on From Warheads to Windmills, How to Pay for a Green New Deal. It's been a pleasure having you. Great. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. For those of you just tuning in, you're here at Nonviolence Radio. I'm Stephanie Van Hook, and hello to all of our listeners. 
Let's turn now to the nonviolence report with Michael Negler. And Michael, you're going to cover some news that we're not going to hear in the mass media or, or quite be explained in the paradigm that is required for the shift to nonviolence in the mass media. Thank you, Stephanie. And you know, I'm just so fascinated by some of the things that Tim Wallace brought up in our recent interview. And um, I wanted to just mention two, two of them quickly. One is he talked about the the level of inequality and that no society has ever survived this level of inequality. Well, there was a sociologist, uh, Ted Gurr, who wrote a well-known little book called Why Men Rebel, and he drew a qualitative distinction between poverty and destitution. And he showed that people, societies, demographic groups can endure poverty almost indefinitely. But there's a point where that grinding poverty grinds its way down to destitution, meaning your kids get sick, they're going to die. You have no access to health care. You can't feed them. Uh, then at that point, people rebel because they have nothing you know, there's nothing, nothing to lose anymore. And it kind of looks to me as though the whole world is moving towards a Ted Gore crisis where so many people are going to be pushed into destitution that they will have to, have to either rebel or, or perish. And it's an extremely interesting, the horrendous kind of crisis. The other thing I want to mention, Tim said, and it's very true, that all this brain power is going into military technology because, as Tim said, quote, that's where the money is. I, I think we also have to look at a deeper issue as well, not to negate that at all, but to say, and I'm going to use a perhaps unfamiliar term here, and I'll explain it, that's where the money is, yes, but that's where the shraddha is. That's where the faith is. That's where we put our hopes for security. That's where we repose our beliefs in reality, that we are locked into postures of hostility and only the ability to harm others will protect us. And so somehow, in addition to the brilliant work that uh, Tim and others are doing with Warheads to Windmills, we do have to address getting people's hearts and minds, opening their eyes to the realization that uh, we do not need to place our reliance in these horrendous weapons in order to uh, live in a secure world. Well, uh, my first and maybe only news item, given the amount of uh, time we've spent, uh, is um, about the fascinating historical crisis uh, in which we find ourselves. This is only the third time in the history of the United States when articles of impeachment have been advanced to the Senate and an extremely interesting crisis of two different forces altogether building up. On the one hand, we have the rule of law and uh, Supreme Court justice taking an oath, having senators take an oath that they will be impartial. Not a single statement that the majority of senators have made in the last month or so have even approached impartiality. So we have a rule of law versus the powerful appeal of a type of presidency, which many people find alarming. And um, there was a book back in the 70s by a fellow named Christopher Lash called Culture of Narcissism. And that has to kind of come into our mind now when we look at the official psychological diagnosis of the president. He has been diagnosed as suffering from malignant narcissism. Now, one narcissistic individual, by him or herself, usually him, is really not capable of doing too much harm. But in a culture where narcissism is promoted, there can be a powerful resonance and many people have now referred to the appeal of the president, whose millions of devoted followers, as a kind of cult phenomenon. Now, you know, I am come from a background in the ancient world. I taught classics for decades, and uh, I know something about how cults work and how mob psychology works. And it is a very disturbing 
observation that malignant cults, death cults of one kind or another, have been occurring frequently with increasing frequency in our country, and that that's, it's not just isolated to a few individuals here and there, uh, but it seems to be a kind of psychology which has cast its icy grip over a significant part of our political awareness. In addition to the shift from poverty to destitution, we have an extremely interesting crisis building up with two entirely different kinds of forces, and the fate of the world depends on which of those two will prevail. Well, against that background, we are now experiencing in India apparently the largest protest that ever happened in human history. Estimates say that there are about 250 million people who are involved across India, but mostly North India. And uh, they are protesting two pieces of pending legislation or partly implemented legislation, the National Citizen Registry, NCR, and the uh, CAA, Citizen Amendment Act, CAA, uh, which would strip many Muslims of their citizenship. Now, there are 200 million Muslims in India, not quite the number of people protesting, which is a, an encouraging sign. Many non-Muslims are joining them. But if you are a Muslim in India, let's say you're in a small village, you've lived, your family has lived in that village for generations, you have no paperwork to ratify your your little land holding and your cottage in that village is very similar to things that happened in the Philippines, for example, where farmers who farmed their land for generations walk out there one morning and find that bulldozers are plowing it uh, to turn it over to dull pineapple. Now, um, however, if you are in India and this happens to you, you have no way to document your citizenship. And there, you know, millions of people could suddenly be stateless uh, because of this rule. Well, the point is that it is obviously, what shall I say, it is obviously communalist and uh, exactly the same kind of mentality that we see here operating against uh, minorities of every kind and color and against immigrants. It, it is a form of xenophobia and, and shrinkage into one's personal uh, identities, which uh, is an extremely malevolent force, and many people recognize that. Uh, in this protest, especially worthy of note, are the women of a, an area in Delhi called Shaheen Bagh, Bagh meaning you know, garden. I'm not sure what Shaheen means. Um, and hundreds of thousands of women have turned out. They, their full-time job is care work has taken the shape of a revolution. That's a quote from one of the reports. The care they show toward their children has now been extended to their fellow women protesters. The love they show toward their families now spills out for their country in the songs they sing throughout the night. Their unpaid labor has transcended the confines of their homes into the expanse of the street. That's a quote from a, an Indian news source. Well, it reminded me of several things. It reminded me, for one thing, of the Rosenstrasse prison protest, where the power of the state came up against a primal human urge, but in this case, a positive, nurturing, caring urge, where uh, Jewish men were rounded up uh, on one day, in f end of February of 1943, in Berlin, and their wives and daughters turned out uh, in protest. Uh, they just simply took up position in the street uh, outside the detention center, which is number one, two, Rosenstrasse, and they refused to move, and in the course of a few days, the Gestapo actually blinked, and all those men were released. And then thousands of Jewish men all across Europe under Nazi occupation were not arrested because of the failure of that arrest in Berlin. So once again, it was the uh, primal sense of nurturing care, of identity, 
on the part of women uh, versus the, in this case, malignant power of the state. It also reminded me of something I learned about the first intifada when I had Mubarak Awad come to talk to my nonviolence class at uh, Berkeley. He pointed out the social changes that were taking place in West Bank cities that were in rebellion against Israeli occupation. And one of those changes was that the level of drug and alcohol abuse stopped. It just dried up. Young people who had nothing to live for, no purpose in their life, suddenly they had a purpose in their life, and they stopped all these abusive, self-destructive habits. Another thing that happened was a very positive change in Palestinian society where women had played a very, uh, were relegated to a relatively minor role. And suddenly, as Mubarak put it, every woman became every child's mother because, uh, you know, there were children, both of whose parents would be in jail and other women would take them in. And it brought them out, brought women out into a much more active role on the one hand, and also brought them out of the families into a cross-national identity. So, I mean, that just shows to me the general principle that nonviolence always works. It always does great work, quite apart from and often in addition to the exact uh, issue that it's applied to. Now, this uh, protest in Shaheen Bagh started on December 15th, 2019. It was quite, uh, quite something for me because just a couple of months before that, I was in Delhi and probably was in that area. And what happened was Delhi police broke into the Jamia Millia Islamia University in Delhi and really brutally assaulted Muslim students who were peacefully protesting the NRC and the CIA. And at the brutality there, we really reached an extremely high level. It just made me feel once again that one of the best things that India could do uh, as a nation would be to implement a widespread universal training for the police and the military. Uh, Andrew Young, for example, a follower of uh, Martin Luther King's, who at one point was our ambassador to the UN under Jimmy Carter, he uh, was actually training Guatemalan police, and it is possible to uh, give them a sense of pride in their acting responsibly and humanely, as, and that's been shown over and over again to be a very powerful motive if you can Uh, raise it to the level of consciousness where people will accept it. So here's this protest, which was started, incidentally, by 10 or 15 women, mostly Muslim women. They just went from alley to alley saying, come out and join us now. And those 10 or 15 have become about 100,000. And now here's another interesting note from our point of view. This is something we've discussed here on the program pretty recently. So the protesters are blocking traffic to some degree, but they have said they will help ease traffic, but they won't move until their demands are met. The blocked road affects more than 100,000 vehicles a day, and sometimes what a 25 or 30-minute journey is taking two to three hours, but the, the point is not obstruction, it's making their protests known so that, uh, now of course the BJP, the Bharata Janata Party, which is the party of Narendra Modi, we're the party behind these uh, obnoxious pieces of legislation, and incidentally the uh, offspring of the party that assassinated Mahatma Gandhi. So the, the BJP chief in Delhi has requested the protesters to stop as a result of the inconvenience. Now, the, the point, that's not surprising. But what I wanted to highlight here is the, uh, w- the awareness, the acknowledgement on the part of the women that th- th- their protest is partly real and partly symbolic, and the point of it is not to hurt and obstruct innocent people who may have nothing to do with it, but to get this legislation resisted. 
In this country, something similar is going on from the point of view of the psychological dynamic, and that is that there's a move here in Sacramento to get the police out of schools. And one of the commenters, again, said, parents care about the well-being of their children, and the police on campus do not make it a safer environment for students. On the one hand, it makes students much more likely to be arrested. This is known as the school-to-prison pipeline, which is a term coined in a, a report of the ACLU back in 2016. And recently, in schools across California, there were 22,746 students referred to the police, and who, almost 10,000 of them arrested in one school year. 2013 to 2014. And of course, need hardly mention the majority of those students were black or Latino. So on the one hand, the police presence creates a sense of insecurity for the students. It elevates ordinary misbehavior to the status of a crime. On the other hand, it has not been shown that the police are exceptionally effective in preventing school shootings and things of that kind. So the psychological element here is uh, that the mothers are caring for their own children and the fact that police in schools do not add to their safety. They just change the environment to one of uh, fear and hostility. A number of things coming up that I'd like folks to know about. Uh, one of them will be on January 27th when Occupy Sonoma County is going to have a teach-in called Effective Strategies for Climate Action, What's Working and Why. It's a free event, and it'll begin at 7 p.m. at the Peace and Justice Center, 467 Sebastopol Avenue in Santa Rosa. And it'll be presented by a union organizer and campaign strategist, mm -hmm. Daniel Solnit. Mm -hmm. I wonder if he's related. Yes. He is to Rebecca and, and David. And so these strategies can be applied, of course, to a number of issues. And to learn more, go to OccupySonomaCounty.org. Well, Stephanie, there are other wonderful things happening in the area, but I hope to get back to them in a couple of weeks. Yeah, you've been listening to Nonviolence Radio. We want to thank our mother station, KWMR, to all of our friends and volunteers at the Meta Center for Nonviolence. Thanks, Matt Watchers and Annie Hewitt, for making this show accessible and transcribed post-show production. And to everybody, let's take care of one another. Thanks, Tim Wallace, also for joining us on the show.